Well, welcome back, guys. We're ready to wrap up our day on Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, and Symbolism with the work of uh, The Scream by Edvard Munch. Um, I have to say I've learned a little bit more this year uh, than I have normally in getting to Monk because he somewhere, sometimes falls in between the 19th and 20th century, and he doesn't get picked back up again until we get to the German Expressionists of the early 1920s. So I was happy at least to have a little more time to do some reading, and I'm going to share what I found out uh, with you today. Okay, let me get rid of my face here, and we'll move on to the last guy for today, uh, Edvard Munch. Now, um, <laughs> Edvard Munch is living at a time when things are constantly being questioned. And I have to remember to tell you that this is exactly the moment in time when Sigmund Freud is getting ready to publish his uh, uh, Psychology of Dreams. Um, with, with works like that out that ask us to plumb the depths of our soul for clues about why we do the things we do, you have to realize that the symbolist movement was given a little bit more fuel um, to add to the fire. Symbolism, um, just so that you know, is basically a movement that discounts everything that we see on the surface and probes um, the realities that are somewhat hidden from our everyday view. Um, that means that psychoanalysis and the psychology of dreams is a perfect idea to consider uh, that perhaps what we see on the surface is actually a mask for things that would carry down deep inside. That for me seems to be fairly true in summing up the works of the, the Oslo Norway uh, Norwegian uh, Edvard Munch. Um, Munch had a troubled past, uh, apparently losing his mother at age five and then his older sister some new, uh, few years after that. Um, the women that were pivotal in his life early died from tuberculosis. Um, so he constantly had a, a kind of um, psychosis or obsessive compulsive disorder about germs and um, um, illness and sickness. Um, sickness and death seem to be a theme that he revisits over and over again, and it makes sense that despair would also be a, rec a recurrent theme here in a work that he painted um, after the, all of these events, uh, well into his years as an art student. Um, this work is called The Sick Child, and it seems to feature a likeness of his older sister in a bed um, uh, on bed rest with an attendant um, who looks fairly familiar uh, to, to Monk as well. Um, it seems like he's trying to come to terms with those early losses as a way to kind of deal with his grief, which will persist throughout his life and cause him to become, um, at different times, wrestle with the issue of alcoholism. Um, in terms of the strong women in his life, um, he laments that they are no longer with him, and it kind of colors his relationships with women all the way through um, his life till his death in the early 1940s. Um, this work uh, seems to be showing us a man in despair, um, uh, collapsing into the lap of a female with long flowing red hair all over uh, the body of the, the, the male figure. Um, an intimate uh, pairing of human figures, but it was later given the nickname Vampire, uh, which is something of a misnomer because Edvard Munch never meant that to be the case. But um, mixing those dark kinds of, of ideas with some of the visual imagery that we see show us that, uh, that Munch's work is going to have a particularly um, darker feel than some of the things we've seen with Van Gogh and Gauguin. Um, that dark color palette, the dark focus on um, isolation and sadness, th those are going to be things that we see uh, plaguing him the rest of his life. But um, his sexual uh, relationships with females would also be somewhat uh, strained. Uh, having grieved so long over a sister and a mother, um, it's going to be something that's going to follow him all the way through his artistic career. In this work called Puberty, we get the sense that this is an awkward silence and an awkward, unwanted uh, glance that we're looking at the model here with um, that basically is intrusive, um, but also somewhat seductive, which is strange. Um, when you look at this picture, which Monk calls Madonna, um, he intended it as a work that celebrates the, the contributions to the life cycle that the female makes from birth, life, and death. Um, but it looks like a, a retelling of the Christian Mary in a very almost vampiric kind of way. 
Um, the, the swirls that you're seeing around that figure should look somewhat familiar. They're the same kind of striations that show up in his work, The Scream, which is part of our image set. So he's already investigating that darker tone, um, which is coming probably as a result of his psycho uh, uh, analysis and psychology of his, his own dreams. Um, in his street scenes, you see that sense of anxiety, um, figures that move towards you randomly pressing forward, unassociated with each other and somewhat cut off from each other as they're living you know, in a society that's very, very close knit. Um, that sense of separation in the midst of a crowd, that inability to talk to the person next to you, um, that, that unwillingness to make a contact with other people seems to be a, present a kind of a strained existence for the artist as well. Notice in this picture painted before the screen, uh, the figure that's off wandering by himself on the street. Um, there are other figures further down, but there's a sense of haunting loneliness about the way the figures simply move in total silence toward the viewer. Um, here in a self-portrait, uh, I think it's called Man Holding a Cigarette, we see again that anxiety um, that basically comes out from the, the agitated brush strokes, the agitated marks that are made on the palette, um, and that ever attentive stare that looks back at the viewer from almost, almost total silence. Um, here in this piece, which is painted shortly before the screen, um, you see the work called Melancholy, and it features a horizon off in the distance with striated clouds there, streaks of clouds, with a figure facing the viewer um, in, in kind of an abstracted piece of work here. This is the kind of painting that's going to really connect him to the German expressionists who come later, with whom he would uh, exhibit, with whom he would share uh, uh, relationships with. Um, what we're seeing is an abstracted landscape with a figure placed there, forcing this into the realm of composition. And if you guys notice, there are edges of the painting there that are unfinished. Um, so it really is more about achieving the composition than it is creating a believable, you know, window on the world, like in the old Renaissance model. But here in a preparatory work, you guys can see this, this work is called Despair. And it features the same format as what will later be called the screen. Um, I can't read Norwegian, um, but I'm assuming that the poem on the right is what we now assume it, uh, is a poem that was written about the topic. And when you look at the finished work, you can definitely see that dramatic changes were made. Now, I'm told that there are four versions of this work all over the world. Um, and one recently was famously stolen from the museum in Oslo, um, and I believe returned. But um, these, these works have continued to populate our modern imagination. Um, in some of the videos that I posted for you, you'll see where they're quoted, they're used in popular culture. Um, but this was pretty uh, innovative for its time period. It's almost a thing that we take for granted today, but you really do need to take a look at it. What you have here is a, a landscape, like we saw in the previous work, where the clouds and the formations in the sky have been reduced to the barest minimum of streaks. Um, they are red, blood red, which is not the color we normally expect to see above our heads with the blue fjords down below and the bright light reflecting off of that icy lake. Um, a, a straight path veers off to the left, but winding forms just billow and take our eye all over this thing. But we always seem to come right back to the middle where the skeletal kind of face has replaced the figure of the man that you saw before. The figure's body is almost stylized into streaks. It doesn't even have, it has a ghost-like shape, right? It's wistful and it's not even, it's not completed on the bottom. If you notice the brush strokes, they end abruptly right before the canvas ends. Um, <clears throat> it's an interesting composition in that it seems to kind of create a universal symbol for that inaudible scream. Um, here in writing about it, let me read you. Um, the quote, um, basically, uh, Monk describes what he was talking about himself. Um, the fiery red and yellow stripes that give the sky an eerie glow also contribute to this work's resonance. Monk wrote a revealing epigraph to accompany the painting. I stopped and leaned against the balustrade, almost dead with fatigue. Above the black blue fjord hung in the clouds red as blood and tongues of fire. 
My friends had left me, and alone, trembling with anguish, I became aware of the vast, infinite cry of nature. Um, so the idea here is that this seems to be um, a summation or an attempt to deal with that uh, that impassable loneliness that we all at one time feel, you know, during our lifetime. There are people there, but they're disassociated from the primal figure. And he seems to be kind of experiencing um, a, a mental break. Uh, the figure is basically alone and the unbearable weight of being in that isolated condition is just almost too much to bear. So he utters an audible scream. Uh, this kind of expressionism uh, uh, that you're gonna see later uh, is, is still part of the post-impressionism world, but it's leering more and more toward the abstract um, where Gauguin and Van Gogh still held figures and, and landscapes that were recognizable, we're now getting to something that really goes deeply into the artist's conception. And that is the whole goal of, of expressionism later. And they will look back to the symbolist uh, uh, forerunner uh, as for, for great um, uh, inspiration. Now, I did find one thing that I thought was interesting, but I just about discounted it pretty much. If you guys take a quick look at this, um, it's highly likely that Gauguin and Monk, who were friends and acquaintances, uh, saw a, an exhibition in Paris of Peruvian mummies. Um, I'm not sure if that was actually the case and, and whether or not it's something that happened that nobody made note of, but when you see the positions of the hands and the head, you kind of wonder if that might be true. Um, uh, as you read the article that I found, basically no one has been able to confirm it, but it's highly possible that just as Gauguin was inspired by the primitive qualities of Tahitian life, um, Monk may have been inspired by the very ghastly, uh, 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 grotesque figures of Peruvian mummies that he saw before. Um, nobody has been able to confirm that, so that abstraction may just be purely that. So um, I probably wouldn't write about that on the art history test, but it does help me remember uh, this piece a little bit better. Um, you guys can see here that this landscape is going to show up in future works. As a matter of fact, if you merge the street scene with a background from the screen, you get this, this work, which is known as isolation. So I, I guess the, since these are recurrent themes in his body of work, it's fair to say that this is something he's going to revisit several times over, and that will get repurposed um, as, as an original idea, um, getting ever more and more abstract. Um, the Kimball has a work by Edvard Monk, and I thought we would take the time to listen to what the curators have to say about it. I'll need to switch off my laptop microphone, so give me just a second to set that up and we'll come right back. In the late 1880s, Edvard Munch began spending his summers at Asgardstrand, a Norwegian seaside resort popular with artists and writers. Over the next 40 years, he depicted the town's waterfront houses and pier often. Munch used this same jetty as the setting for his most famous work, The Scream. It shows a single figure in extreme distress. Here are three girls who show no obvious signs of emotion, and indeed, the one who's looking towards us is faceless. But still, the mood that Munk creates is strangely disturbing. And that comes partly from the rushing perspective of the jetty and the road beyond, which is contrasted with the serene horizontals that dominate the rest of the setting. It is one of those summer nights that you get in the far north of Europe, when it stays light all night, creating a magical or eerie mood, depending on your sensibility. Munch saw painting as a way of getting through immediate appearances to the primal realities of life. So showing two of these girls looking at the full moon, it connects them, and indeed the state of girlhood generally, with the idea of the natural world with all its cycles and changes. The moon, of course, is associated with strange supernatural influences, with the upsetting of the rational order of things, with the fascination with another world. This too plays into the overall mood of Munch's painting. 
Unexpected colors and quick, nervous brushstrokes heighten the mood of tension and anxiety, expressing not just how Munch saw life, but how he felt it. All right, so we're back now having listened to the Kimball. Much of what you can say about the Kimball's work is true about the scream. Those agitated brushstrokes and uncommon connections with color, those are all helped to create an overall sense of unease. Um, this is a work by another artist, uh, Ed, uh, Kirchner, uh, Ernst Kirchner, who we'll talk about as part of the German Expressionism movement. And if you put uh, Munch's work, uh, street scenes, side by side, you can see directly they were highly influenced by one another. Uh, a Kirchner basically copies this street scene in Dresden and basically paints what he sees underneath the skin of all the people on the street, which is a ghastly kind of collection of macabre figures um, who move about their daily lives, um, showing a, another kind of side uh, on their outside skins, right? Um, that will be the goal of expressionism. So we're definitely going to see that kind of, of, of co color combination, agitated brush strokes, and even more exacerbated color um, when we get to the 20th century. But they, they had to get it from somewhere, and it comes from the world of symbolism and post-impressionism of the 19th century. So I will stop there since Rousseau is not on the image set. Um, and wrap up our last video of the day. Thank you guys. I appreciate you being here. I'll talk with you more next time.